Sean returned home from the company in the evening, dark clouds covering the sky, accompanied by occasional dull thunder. It was a sign of an impending storm. Raindrops started pouring down heavily, and it was at this moment that Edward, who hadn't been seen for over a month, appeared. Dean, Wisnevel reminds you to click the subscribe button in the bottom right corner to read the complete novel. He knocked down the bodyguards outside the villa with his men and kicked the door open. Edward locked his gaze directly on me, chewing gum lazily and smiling leisurely. Rita Flynn, I'm here to take you away. This time, he can't stop me. Due to the chaos he had just caused, I was in a flurry and almost burnt the soup I was cooking for Sean. Impatiently, I looked at the troublemaker. I've told you I'm not leaving, can you stop bothering me? Edward moved his neck, sneered, and looked arrogantly. Whether you leave or not, you have to leave. Throughout the whole incident, Sean sat on the sofa, indifferently watching the farce. After a moment, a deafening thunder woke up the stagnant atmosphere. Sean stood up and casually sat at the dining table. Did you stew soup today? He asked, casually. I nodded, slowly. Obviously, he didn't take Edward seriously. Edward sneered, Sean, is pretending fun? I came today not only to take Rita away, but also to reminisce about the past with you. Leaning against the door frame, he looked somewhat nostalgic. Do you still remember? Five years ago, when you were nothing, you were no different from a stray dog. Whenever something went wrong at home, you were the punching bag. Hey, let me ask you, do you remember how many slaps and kicks you endured? I was stunned. The system only vaguely mentioned that Sean had a tough time those years, but the details were the most shocking. Edward frowned, keep telling telling, Sean, you were born to be a loser. His words were filled with undisguised sarcasm and smugness. I clenched the edge of the table tightly, unable to hold back anymore, after he finished speaking. I directly threw the bowl in my hand towards him. What kind of person are you to judge others? Edward, I always thought you were scum, but I didn't expect you to be trash. Edward was caught off guard and got hit on the forehead. He immediately lowered his brows, looking at me, gritting his teeth. You hit me for this loser? Hearing those words, my anger, which had not subsided, grew stronger. As I picked up another bowl, ready to throw it again, Sean raised his hand to stop me. When he looked at Edward, there was no hint of anger in his eyes. I heard you dote on your cousin? He suddenly asked an irrelevant question. Edward's gaze sharpened. What do you mean? Sean smiled, picked up the pad beside him, played a video, and pushed it towards Edward. The girl's screams in the video were particularly piercing. The clear image showed that she had been kidnapped. The moment Edward recognized the girl in the video, his face turned pale instantly. He forced a smile. She's not in the country. Can the traces of video synthesis be more obvious? Sean also smiled. She's in Valencia. Almost as soon as he finished speaking, the boy who had been arrogant just now seemed to have been drained of all his strength. The system had mentioned to me before that Edward treated his cousin as if she were his own sister. With a loud bang, Edward knelt down without any warning. The situation reversed instantly. After a while, the young man hoarsely spoke. The hand hanging by his side clenched tightly, filled with unwillingness. But he had to bow his head in submission. Sean, I beg you to save her. Sean brought a deck of cards from the living room. Leisurely, he walked up to Edward and squatted down. My gaze fell on the lips curled up by Sean. His smile was full of interest. Suddenly, I had a feeling. All of Edward's provocations just now were like a clown's performance. The real game was just beginning. Sean casually drew out a card and held it between his fingertips. Flipped it over. It was the ace of spades. Your cousin's life is in your hands. Kneeling to me won't help you. In the gentlest tone, Sean introduced the cruelest rules of the game. I'll give you five chances. If you draw either of the two jokers, I'll save your sister. If you fail to draw one in five attempts, like this one, Sean shook the ace of spades in his hand. Then he took a dagger from the bodyguard, who was bruised all over, and threw it in front of Edward. He smiled, or you let your sister be executed by those people, or you cripple your right hand. But she can survive. Edward had no choice, but to agree. He was prepared to cripple his right hand. Edward used up the five chances in just one minute. He didn't draw it. Sean's smile remained unchanged, such a pity. After saying that, he stood up and walked to the wine cabinet, taking out a bottle of Glenfiddich. He poured himself some, watching Edward leisurely. The chaotic sound of the rain outside was annoying. It was escalating endlessly. The young man picked up the knife without any hesitation, but his slightly trembling hand revealed a hint of fear. He held the knife in the air, then stopped abruptly. He looked at me again, pulling the corners of his dry mouth. Rita, don't look at me. I felt a bit complicated, although I always thought I had a clear position as an outsider in this world. But facing the slightly bloody struggle of the wealthy for the first time, I couldn't help feeling a bit of palpitation. I slightly turned my head Head, shifting my gaze away, directly facing Sean. I suddenly realized that since Edward appeared, Sean had never looked at me. But before I could think more, Edward had already made a move. I instinctively tensed my body, but there was no movement. Two seconds later, I turned back to look. The tip of the knife was only about two centimeters away from the back of his hand. The bodyguard promptly stopped him. A light laughter suddenly broke the silence in the air. Sean toyed with the cup in his hand, speaking casually. Don't mind, just a joke. As for your cousin, she should be on her way back to the country 
Jeffrey, she's very safe. The video was from a few days ago, Sean had already saved his cousin. Edward immediately reacted, arching his body and flipping the scattered playing cards all over the floor. His movements quickly stopped, and he stared at Sean across the space. The two brothers, one noble, one disheveled. The stark contrast was evident. Are you playing me? There are no jokers in this deck of cards at all. Sean neither confirmed nor denied. From the beginning, this was just a setup. Sean stood at the end of this game, leisurely enjoying the sight of his younger brother's naive antics, floundering like a clown. Sean, you win this time. Edward stood up, supporting his knees. But I don't have to be foolish forever, being played by you every time. I watched the back of the boy leaving, throwing my brows slightly. After much hesitation, I still grabbed an umbrella and chased after him, completely unaware of Sean behind me, clenching the cup until it cracked. Edward, I called out to him. The boy was soaked all over, looking slightly dispirited. I composed myself before speaking softly. Can you stop bothering Sean anymore? What did he do wrong that you have to oppose him like this all the time? Edward turned around. You really like him, huh? That's why you're taking his side? Sean is just a love child of a mistress. Edward said angrily. His presence made my mom uneasy until the day she passed away. His existence represents my dad's infidelity, making a woman who has always thought her husband deeply loved her feel deeply betrayed. Do you know how painful her life was? I calmly waited for him to finish before speaking. Is it Sean's fault? Can he choose his own birth? It's your father who's wrong, the man who only cared about his own happiness and was completely irresponsible. Edward tightly pursed his lips, obviously not convinced. Edward, you're wrong. His mother is not the mistress you mentioned. She is also a victim in that relationship. The boy in front of me paused, as if not understanding what I was saying. I knew he would investigate on his own. Without wasting more words with him, I returned to the villa. Rita, I stopped in my tracks. Do you really not like me anymore? A question devoid of substance. I didn't want to answer, so I lifted my foot to leave. Edward spoke again, his voice very low. After my parents passed away, I was the only one left. If you give up on me again, there will be no one left in this world who loves me. I thought, maybe it was because his crush, Camila, went abroad after graduating, that he settled for me instead. But what I didn't expect was that I had already fallen for his brother. Edward, at least you have been loved. But Sean, at the age of 27, had never felt it before. Back at the villa, Sean was still standing in front of the wine cabinet, with his back to me. The living room was now empty, except for him. Why did you come back? Sean turned the misplaced wine bottles around without looking back. What? He paused, shook his head with a smile, then turned around and walked towards me. At first, you only saw me once and said it was love at first sight. So what? Edward was right. I used to live like a dog, even more lowly than a dog. You just saw it earlier, my twisted mind. Aren't you afraid that one day I might impulsively kill you if you stay by my side? The man in front of me, in a joking tone, almost self-destructively confessed for the first time. It turned out that Sean intentionally didn't let me avoid him just now. He revealed his most authentic self. Suddenly, I saw through the unease beneath his casual demeanor. The usually silent system spoke up for once. He actually hopes you'll stay. I knew. He was being extremely open and honest with me. He was preparing for me to leave. The tiny flicker of hope was dimmed. As my gaze wandered, it suddenly fell on his slightly withdrawn right hand. Why haven't you cleaned your wound? I immediately disregarded his words from earlier and lifted his right hand to inspect. Sean hesitated for a rare moment, then quickly pulled his hand back. What do you mean? His smile faded slightly. As I reached for his hand again, I replied casually. Okay, I get it. You were pitiful as a child, and now you've turned into a pervert, right? Can you come with me to treat your wound now? I was too tired to argue with him, so I just pushed him onto the sofa and started treating his wound with the first aid kit. Sean Seaborn. I kept my eyes down, my hands busy. It was the first time I called him by his full name. Stop belittling yourself. As I bandaged his wound, I said, you haven't done anything wrong. Clearly, you remember every little good thing others do for you. Why do you always act like a pervert? The system just told me that Edward's cousin once gave each child a piece of candy when they visited the Seaborn family, including Sean. That was the first time he, as a child, was treated equally. He remembered it for many years. So, this time, he saved the girl. Back then, I naively thought that Sean was actually a normal person, and that his perversion was just a facade. It wasn't until later that I found out. After many nights of torment in bed with him, I realized he was truly twisted. Who would use those things? And how could ice cubes be put inside someone's body? I artfully tied a bow at the end of the gauze. I sent it pretty? What did you say to Edward when you chased after him just now? Ignoring my art piece, he went straight to another topic. I shrugged and replied simply. Told him to stop sticking to me like a dogskin plaster from time to time, making a mess, and disturbing me from chasing you. It's so annoying. Sean lifted his eyes to look at me. The heavy rain outside seemed to have stopped at some point. The gloominess faded away. Clouds drifted by, letting in a little light, reflected in the man's eyes. I looked at this face that was hard not to fall in love with at first sight, feeling a bit moved. As if possessed, I spoke softly. Can I 
kiss you? I seem to have really started to like Sean. Where do you want to kiss? He asked. I knelt on the sofa, held his face, and kissed his eyelid. Here, I answered after the kiss. In hindsight, it seemed a bit impolite to do so. Fortunately, Sean didn't mind. His eyes were so dark that they seemed indelible. Slowly getting closer to me, our lips were only about one centimeter apart. Why don't you kiss here? His voice was low, and the atmosphere suddenly became ambiguous and heated. I blinked, feeling a bit embarrassed. Can I? I cautiously sought his opinion. You can. The man's voice seemed intentionally seductive. My mind was a bit slow to react. I tentatively leaned over and lightly touched him. Soft and a bit cool. Aren't you going to kiss again? Lost in his tenderness, I listened to his words and kissed him again. But this time, it was not just a brief touch. Sean held me and slowly pressed me against the sofa. From the initial gentle caresses to later parting my lips directly, he completely took my breath away. Sean placed one hand on the back of my neck, adjusting the direction back and forth to match his kiss. The other hand supported on the armrest of the sofa beside my ear. In a trance, I felt his wordless yet surging love. Before I could say anything that day, Sean was called away by his assistant to deal with urgent documents at the company. He didn't return until evening. By then, I had just finished taking a shower. In his hand, he held a box about the size of a palm. As he entered my bedroom, he pressed my shoulders, pinning me against the door. Sean slightly adjusted his tie knot and then leaned down. I instinctively blocked him. What are you doing? Kissing you. Sean pulled my hand away and forcefully turned up my chin. Just before he kissed me, he chuckled self-deprecatingly. In a murmuring tone, he said, I've been thinking about this the whole afternoon. As we kissed, Sean suddenly lifted me up. He carried me to the edge of the bed and gently set me down, leaning against the headboard. After a moment, Sean withdrew slightly. I calmed my breathing and then began to reproach him. Mr. Seaborn, you can't just kiss a girl casually like this. If we're not in a confirmed relationship, I won't let you kiss me again. Sean nodded. Then, he took out a silver chain from the box. It was adorned with delicate diamonds, exceptionally beautiful. He knelt on one knee in front of me, lifted my right foot to rest on his knee, and placed the anklet around my ankle. The next moment, without warning, Sean lightly kissed the back of my foot. He defined our relationship. You are mine. I widened my eyes, feeling a tingling sensation on my foot. How could he kiss my foot after kissing me? As I was still in a daze, Sean looked at me. His eyes were gentle, with a faint smile on his lips. He gently threatened, you agreed to stay here yourself. If one day you try to run away, but I catch you and bring you back, I will cripple your legs and lock you in this room forever. Perhaps only Sean in the whole world could turn a confession into a threat? What if I die? If the mission was successful, I should leave soon. What would Sean do then? Before I could finish my sentence, a slight pain shot through my ankle. Ouch. Sean's hand gripping my ankle tensed instantly. I raised my head, stunned. In all this time, I had never seen Sean lose his composure. He was always calm, mostly with a relaxed smile. This was the first time I saw him expressionless, even with a suppressed sense of an impending storm. I chuckled lightly. I was just joking. Sean quietly watched me. Only when I started to feel uneasy did he soften his expression. In a very refined tone, he said, I hope this is the last time I hear such words. He went back to his threatening ways. Finally, he released my foot, sat at the edge of the bed, and leaned over. I covered my mouth tightly. No kissing. Why not? You just kissed my feet, don't you know? On this matter, I would not back down. For the next three days, don't even think about kissing me. Sean, rarely at a loss, was taken aback. Recalling all the threatening remarks he had just made, I silently shook my fist at his departing figure. He deserved it. After the three-day deadline passed, Sean had no more reservations. He finished his breakfast and was about to go to the company, while I was still leisurely drinking my porridge. In the next moment, he lifted me up by the waist. I was originally sitting on the chair, but it turned into Sean sitting on the chair, with me on his lap. I'm still drinking my porridge. I mumbled unclearly. I'm about to leave, can you give me a kiss first? Hmm? After saying that, a passionate kiss descended upon me. Fine. I compromised and opened my mouth, letting him kiss me. But it lasted too long. As we kissed, Sean let go of me to let me catch my breath. Then, he kissed me again, repeatedly. After Sean left, I went to get my bowl of porridge, but it had already gone cold. Gradually, I learned to control my breathing. Sometimes Sean would be busy until the early hours of the morning. I was almost falling asleep. In a daze, I felt Sean sitting by my bed, leaning down with his hand on the bedpost. Instinctively, I opened my mouth to receive his kiss. Sean's kisses were rarely urgent or intense. Just like him, they were more about a skilled touch. Several times, as we kissed, I fell asleep like that. The comfortable days almost made me forget about the mission. The system couldn't stand it and spoke up again. His affection for you has reached the target value. As as long as you make Sean sincerely say that sentence, your mission will be completed. You can go home. The final step was to make Sean confess his true feelings for me, and then I could leave here. In my original world, I was actually an orphan, living like a transparent person. It's not that I was particularly attached to my original world. What made me hesitate was whether Sean really needed me that much. How much did he like
like me, I was betting on the rest of my life.